Welcome back to the Basic Business Training One course. And uh, this is our second session where we will be looking at God's great directives. We want to understand in this, in this particular session the biblical foundation for why we believe that business is a calling from God and marketplace ministry. If I were to ask you what is the first command that you know of in the Bible, too often we, we go into the New Testament for the first command, but we want to back ourselves way up uh, back to the, the beginning of our scripture, which is in Genesis 1 and 2. And we call the first directive that we have been given, we call it the great commitment. And we will talk about that today. We, in this session, we will look at the great commitment. Uh, we will look at the great commission. And we will look at the great commandment. And we believe that these three directives are from God are, are like a stool. I don't know if you, you've sat on stools or, or you have a stool. And a stool has three legs. And, and when the stool has three legs, you can sit on it and you can balance very nicely. But if one of those legs is shorter than the other, or if one of those legs is missing becomes very difficult to sit. You have to balance yourself. It, 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 there's a lot of tension in your body as you're trying to balance. A stool was meant to have three legs, and we believe very strongly that God has given us three great directives, three commands that we are to follow. And out of these three commands working together, we are able to be the representation that God has asked us to be. And so if you see in your workbook, you will see a, a picture of the, the three different great directives. And uh, we want to take a look at each one of those, knowing that you probably very, know pretty well the great commandment and the call to love our neighbor, as well as the great commission and the call to, to make disciples and be disciples. So we'll spend a little bit more on the first one, which is what a lot of us have, have not learned a lot about or spent a lot of time on, which we call the great commandment. We believe that each of these three directives actually leads us to different outcomes. And I, I introduced that to you in the last session. Uh, but we, we want us, as we begin doing our work, to keep in mind these four different outcomes uh, that we believe that these three directives lead us to. And so in your book, you will see this, that the, the great commitment leads us to an economic bottom line. And we'll talk more about why in a few minutes, as well as an environmental bottom line or outcome. When I use the word bottom line, I'm, I'm talking about an outcome or a goal. And so we have an economic goal. We have an environmental goal. We believe that that's part of God's commitment to us when he has committed the earth to us. And we, therefore, are committed to do this for God. The great commandment is to love your neighbor. And that is a social goal. And there are many businesses now that have what they call corporate social responsibility, CSR. And that is a recognition that as businesses, we are to contribute to the communities. And as Christians, we know this because of the great commandment. God has called us to love our neighbor as ourselves. What does that look like in our workplace? Lastly, we have the Great Commission. And the Great Commission uh, gives us a missional outcome or a, a missional bottom line. And that means that we are to be disciples we also are to make disciples. And so we want to look at what does that look like in our workplace rather than an evangelistic effort that takes place by the church. What does this look like when we are the church, when we are scattered in our different spheres of influence and fulfilling that? So now let's dig a little bit deeper into these directives. And the first one, as I said, we call the great commitment. And we believe that, that in Genesis 1.28, God is committing the earth to us. Genesis 2.15, he says that we are to work it and we are to care for it. And he said, this is the, I give you all the seeds and all the animals and, and everything for you to use and to also take care of. And so we, in turn, are committed to fulfilling Genesis 1.28 and Genesis 2.15. And so there is a commitment that has taken place that we are to work and to care for this creation that God has given us. Genesis 1.28 actually says, And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion or govern the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so when we see Genesis 1.28, it starts by telling us that God blessed them. I think many times in my life I have thought about blessing as receiving something. Uh, God blessed me. I, I received. And I forget that blessing is actually an empowerment. But when God blesses us, he is empowering us to do something. And so this scripture, this verse begins by saying, and God blessed them and told them, 
be fruitful and multiply, fill, reign, and subdue. And God, when he blessed them, he was empowering them to do that. God will not ask you to do something that he doesn't empower you with the ability to do it. And so blessing is not passive receiving, but it is an active equipping. Now, oftentimes when we think about Genesis 1.28 and, and we ask people, what do you think about when you read this verse? People often smile and they'll chuckle even. And they say that it's about having babies. It's about having children. And we want to say, yes, that's true. But it's so much more than that. There's so much more in this text. Why would God use five different words to the simple um, and complex act of having children? And we believe it's because these five words have very different responsibilities that are carried out. The first is to be fruitful. And being fruitful is about is about creativity. It's about taking the things that God has given us and and figuring out what to do with them and and to to take a tree that God has created and make a chair out of it or make a bed out of it or make a violin out of it. That is the creativity, the, the fruitfulness that God has given us one thing and we have been able to figure out how to be fruitful in that. And so God has blessed us to be fruitful, to be creative, because God is a creative God and we are made in his image. We are then called also to, uh, to multiply that creativity. And so some of us are involved in, in figuring out how to make a chair and then others say, wow, that's really great. There's a lot of people that could use chairs where we live. And so they figure out how to multiply that and, and bring the increase of that to many other places. And we're reminded in this text that God did not create us as employees, but he created us to be co-creators with him. We are co-laborers with God. And so he equips us and he gives us that creativity. And, And in Adam and Eve were the seeds of creativity that would end up building this world as we see it today, which is an amazing place with electricity and internet and airplanes and all these things that allow us to flourish That came from Adam and Eve, who were blessed and endowed to be able to to start the process in the Garden of Eden. So when we multiply things, we, we we are multiplying the products and services so that even more of the population can be involved in that. The third word in this text is the word fill, fill the earth. What does it mean to fill the earth? And this is where I believe that the words really speak to having children. And and we are called upon to fill the earth. And and God wants us to do that. And and I think we've done pretty well. Uh, We're close to 8 billion people. And that has led to people being seen not as the problem, but as the solution. I remember it was, I don't remember, I remember being told about 70 years ago that there was a concern that there was too many people in the world that the we would not be able to feed everybody and there would be mass starvation. And that was where some population control discussion started. But, but what we have seen is that we grew at that time from 2.5 billion people to 8 billion people today, and there's more than enough food to feed everybody. Now, I'm not saying that everybody has more than enough food because, we, because of sin. Many, some of us have more than others, and others, some of us don't have enough. But there is enough. God created this world with enough capacity for 8 billion people to be cared for and fed. And that is because the people themselves are created and are working in a system together to help this world flourish and to be a better place. The next word in Genesis 128 is the word subdue. And uh, in Genesis 2, 4, and 5, it says, When the Lord God made the heavens and the earth, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth, and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Because the word subdue is actually to bring under control. Sometimes I remember when my children were little and, and we were sitting in church together and, and, and my daughter did something that made her brother laugh and they just burst out laughing and it's like, shh, you're not supposed to do that in church. You have to be quiet. We subdue our children. We help to bring them under our will. And God has given us that command for vegetation, certainly. We have an exuberant God who, who has made plants that have more seeds than they ever could actually uh, uh, see prosper because we would just be overrun with plants. And so we subdue the earth. We subdue the earth in many ways, in many different situations, in order to bring it under control for the flourishing 
of creation. Subduing also has an implication in there that we subdue, but we don't squash it. We, we want to maintain it so that it continue to flourish as well. And that brings us to the next word, which is rain. We are given um, rain over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the animals that scurry around along the ground. To rain is to exercise authority. God has given us authority, but sometimes we've taken that authority and we've defined it as domination as opposed to dominion. God says that we are to reign like benevolent kings. And Psalm 72, verses 6 through 8, tells us this. It says, May the king's rule be refreshing like spring rain on freshly cut grass, like the showers that water the earth. May all the godly flourish during his reign. May there be abundant prosperity until the moon is no more. May he reign from sea to sea and from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. God is calling us to reign as a benevolent king. And that means that we are to reign so that the citizens of the kingdom uh, of which we are a part of can continue to flourish as well in all things. And so we need to reign, recognizing that we want these these gifts that God has given us to be there for future generations so that the flourishing can continue. And so Genesis 128 has five very distinct different mandates and commands that we can see that that play out often in the marketplace, in in the work that we are doing. How do we accomplish Genesis 128? Well, Genesis 215, as I've referred to which says the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. Work is not an appendix to mission. In fact, it is rather the main story. It's what we were created to do. God gave these commands before the fall in Genesis chapter 3. The purpose of our creation, the reason that God put us on this earth was to cultivate and to, to, to be co-creators and co-laborers with him to help this world flourish, to reign over, to subdue, to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill. That's the beauty of our creation. That is what God made us to do. Psalm 115 verse 16 says, The heavens belong to the Lord, but he has given the earth to all humanity. And so we have a responsibility to work for creation. We also have a responsibility to care for creation. And those are two very different things. And I've met many people along the way who are working for creation and are taking good advantage of the things that creation has offered in terms of natural resources, but we always haven't been so careful to care for creation and to leave creation in a better place than when we found it. I know Growing up, my mother would say, if we would go visit an aunt or an uncle, she would say, leave the place better than how you found it. And that is what we are to do with creation as well. We are to leave creation better than we found it so that future generations can continue to flourish for as long as the Lord tarries. One day he will return and and we will have a new heavens and a new earth. But until then, we are part of the restoration of bringing the kingdom of heaven on earth a little bit at a time. Revelation 11, verse 18b says, It is time to destroy all who have caused destruction on the earth. And that's a harsh statement. But right now, the world is generating 3.5 million tons of solid waste every single day. I I can't even describe to you what 3.5 million tons of solid waste is. It's a, a number that I can't fathom what that even looks like. But... Every day that is being created, and much of that is going into our oceans. And much of that, we tend to think for ourselves, at least in my family, we've had discussions of, well, it's just, you know, it's just one time. You know, it's it's just, you know, I, I needed I needed the plastic wrap, I needed the plastic bag, I needed a straw. These things that end up in our waterways cause dilemmas for the world and for future generations. And so we are given a challenge to both work and to care for creation. And so coming back to the great commitment, there are two outcomes that we believe every Christian needs to, to keep in mind. The first is an economic outcome or an economic goal. We are to be fruitful and multiply. God has given us all of these wonderful things in this earth, and he expects us to take them, and he expects us to multiply them. And I'm sure that maybe you're thinking about the parable of the talents and that, that those were things that we were to take and not just hold on to and not just keep for ourselves, but to contribute to and to increase 
for the flourishing of all people. The second uh, great directive then, uh, uh, the outcome from the commitment directive is environmental, and that is how are we to care for the environment, and, and, and what is it that we can do in our own household, and in our workplace, and in our church, and in our community? How do we show the love of God? How do we love our neighbor by loving creation? How do we show God that we love him by being a steward of creation? And so that is the great commitment, and, and that may be the first time that you're hearing that, and, and you need to think through, what are the implications? If we thought it was about having children, and yes, that is an important component, but remember that you can't have 8 billion people without having to feed 8 billion people, and to clothe 8 billion people, and to house, and to educate, and give medical care, and all of these other things. And so we say that Genesis 128 is about procreation, having children, but it's also about productivity because you can't have one without the other. You need the two to go together. From there, we then go to the Great Commandment. And the Great Commandment, of course, is found in Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. And it says, The love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. And so we know this. We know that we are to love our neighbor. And, of course, we love the story of the Good Samaritan where, where the, 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 the lawyer was actually asking Jesus, who is my neighbor? And what's interesting is that Jesus chose a business person uh, to illustrate compassionate love. We believe the Samaritan was a business person who was on his way um, uh, to, to Jericho, finding his way. And in, with him, he had bandages, and he had oil, and he had wine. And so there was some sort of business that he was doing. When, when he saw the injured man that was there, he knew that there was uh, the opportunity that it could be a trick, that he might be robbed himself. You know, the, the Levite and the priest had passed by. They were probably on their way to, to do a holy sacrament, maybe. They didn't want to get their hands dirty. But there was also a risk that if they stopped, uh, they also might be attacked. But the Samaritan, uh, who Jesus used in this scenario, was willing to stop. And, and what if that Jewish man, because it was a Jewish man who had been beaten, what if he died in his care? There would be consequences. But that Samaritan man was willing to take the risk. And business people tend to be risk takers. Uh, he had money for the inn, and, and he was able to negotiate with the innkeeper to be able to, to, uh, to say, take care of this man, and I'll, I'll pay you when I get back. He had a relationship that was there. And so what we can see is that, is that God is, uh, Jesus is using this example that our neighbor is the person that we meet as we are going about our business. And, and we have to be willing to take those risks and to see those opportunities. And as we see those opportunities to use those relationships and networks that we have created over good relationships and, and good experience to be able to help this world flourish. In fact, we, we see in Scripture that Christ's love compels us because we have been loved so much. Therefore, we are compelled to love others. And I know and believe that in your places of work and in your businesses, there are people that God is calling you to love. There are, are people that you are, are coming into contact with who need the love of Christ and need to see somebody who can smile at them and, and not maybe say directly, God loves you, but to love them through your actions and to love them by doing business, your work with excellence, and to love them by simply asking the question, how are you doing? And that can be a very great kindness for people. And so the great commandment is, is where we, what, we fill, what we fulfill as we are going about our work and, and in our workplaces. Who is God calling you to love? And then the last of these three, these three legs of our stool, we have the great commandment, commitment, we have the great commandment, and now we want to take a look at the Great Commission. And of course, we hear about the Great Commission frequently in our churches, and that's very good because it's, it's very important. It's, it's where in Matthew 28, verse 19, uh, Jesus is about to ascend into heaven, and he says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all these things that I have commanded you. And so in Matthew 28... We see not four commands, as many people often think, but just one command. The command that we are given is to make disciples. 
How do we make disciples? Well, sometimes we think the command is to go, but it's actually uh, as you go about your business, as you are going about your life. If we think back in Exodus, when, when they are told that they, as they are to go about their walking and, and sharing with their children and their family, they are to share about God and who he is. And it's a similar word that's being used here in Matthew 28. You are to go as you go about your business. It doesn't mean you pick up and you move to another land. While you are going about the, what God has given you to do, you are to make disciples. And then, how do we make disciples? We baptize them and we teach them. And so the key word that we want to focus on is making disciples. But some of the things I think that we forget is that I may be so focused on making disciples that I forget to be a good disciple. And my workplace The testimony that I give and the work that I do is how I show that I am a disciple of God. And there are some people that that have said, I think it was Gandhi who said, uh, I like your Jesus, but I don't like your Christians. And so sometimes we have to think about, does our behavior in the workplace carry that fragrance of Jesus? Does it carry the scent that that will attract people to know more about God? Do we do our work with excellence? Are we being a disciple? Are we loving our neighbor? Are we, are we doing things that, that would cause people to want to draw near? And if we aren't, and then we try to make disciples, they will say, I'm not sure that I want to be serving a God that causes you to behave in this way. So we have to reflect on ourselves. Am I being a disciple? And then am I able to make disciples? Who is God identifying in my sphere of influence Uh, that I want to be praying about, asking for an opportunity to share with them, to pray with them, to invite them uh, to a a deeper discussion, to to have coffee with them, to, to explore more about who they are. And that is fulfilling the Great Commission in our workplace. You are able to go to places that your pastor is not able to go to. You have interactions with people that might never set foot in a church. And so you have that opportunity, and it's not something that we leave only to those who are in church work. We are all in church work because we are the church as the people of God. And so we are to make disciples uh, by loving, helping those around us discover the truth of God's love and then help them live out that truth in every area of their lives. Work is the platform that God has given us for making disciples. Work is where the great commandment is lived out and the great commission is carried out. And so God has called every believer into his service. And discipleship in the midst of our work is the key to fulfilling the great commission directive. Let's think about that. Discipleship in the midst of our work is the key to fulfilling the great commission. And sometimes what we want to to do is to assign the Great Commission to evangelistic programs. And and what we believe is that that those, those may be good things to do, but we have been given that opportunity in every day of our lives in the spheres of influence, the gardens, that shall we say, that we have been given to have influence. And so we want to continue to think about this and talk about this during this course, the three great directives. How do we fulfill the fourfold goals that come out of that? Just as God placed man, the first man in the Garden of Eden to work it and to care for it, so God has placed each of us in our own gardens to serve him. And a question I want to ask you is, where is your garden? Where is the garden that God has given you? What type of of garden are you working in? For myself, there are a number of different gardens. I have a marriage garden, and I need to tend to that garden. Uh, I need to make sure that weeds are not coming up, that that the plants growing in my marriage garden are healthy and fruitful. I have a garden with my children. There are, there, are, there are different relationships with my children that I need to tend to and be aware of. And again, make sure that, that weeds are staying out and that there can be a flourishing that's happening. I have a workplace. Uh, that, that garden also needs tending. And I need to be aware of, of what God is calling for that garden to produce and to be sure that I'm planting the right thing and in the right time and giving the right amount of water and the right amount of attention. I also am part of a community, and so I have a community garden that I need to tend to. And which neighbors is God calling me to love? And 
what does that look like as I, as I think about them? And how can I interact with them? And God, how can you allow me to know how to love my literal neighbors? And we have other different gardens. Our church is another garden. How much, what are we doing to help the church when it's gathered in the building to also flourish? And, and, and what is my part and my participation in that? And so my question for you at the end of the session is to reflect on, on the garden that God has given you and how can you be fruitful in it? What is the creativity that God has given you? How can you multiply what others are doing so that more people can have access to it? Are you filling the earth? Are you reigning over it? Are you subduing it? And these words are going to have different meanings for us as we consider our gifts and our talents, the time that God has given us, the, the location, the, the resources that we have. Uh, but we do believe that this is a calling for each one of us and that we want to fulfill. So let me uh, end the session by saying a word of prayer over us as we think about these three, three great directives and God's call on our lives. Father, we thank and praise you for being a God who has given us this opportunity to take your word into every sphere of influence that we have, every garden. Thank you, Father, for blessing us by equipping us and, and, and helping us to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth and to reign over it and subdue it. And Father, we ask for your forgiveness for the times that we have worked it, but we have not cared for it. We ask for your forgiveness in the times that we haven't worked for it because we haven't understood that our work is a calling and that the way that we do our work is important and it's a reflection of you, that we have not been good disciples in being stewards of our time and in keeping our word and commitments to people. Father, we pray that you help us as we get going in this course together that we may know what it means to live out the three great directives, to love our neighbor, to be on mission, to be a disciple, and to do it within the, the spheres of influence that you have given us. Thank you, Lord, for this calling. Thank you for your equipping, and thank you for your Holy Spirit for the continual prompting that we get. In your name we pray. Amen.